Hello, Mr. Frost. Welcome Hello. to Turkey. Thank you. It's a great honor to have you here. It's a great all. honor to be here. It's a lovely city. Thank you. And so I'm, I want to start uh, with a question about uh, the post-truth era and the uh, impact of research. Uh, we live in the age of post-truth and also uh, with the, thanks to the innovations in technology, uh, the research is, uh, has never been easier. Uh, and the flow of information is also uh, very uh, common in this world. So, uh, in that sense, uh, why do you think that uh, the truth does not relate to the uh, ordinary people uh, as it does in the fake news? Gosh, that's a very, very complex question. Um, I don't despair about uh, people's relation to truth as much as other people do. I have been a marketer for a very long time and I've learnt that it's very difficult to fool all of the people all of the time. I think people are cannier, uh, wiser uh, than you know. Uh, I do think there has been a reaction to so-called professionals, uh, mm -hmm. which has not been helped by the polls, which have allegedly consistently got it wrong it's very difficult to explain to people that actually the polls aren't as wrong as they think because mm -hmm. it, that depends on a statistical knowledge that frankly, most people can't be bothered to have. And why should they? Uh, I think we need to sell these things better. But I actually think that in general, most people are alive to what is a blatant untruth and what isn't. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the impact on research of post-truth has been as big as people worry about. Uh, I think that with more data going around, more clients need more help mm -hmm. to make sense of it. Because all we have is a sort of data <coughs> soup at the moment. A lot of it is dirty, mm -hmm. a lot of it is not relevant, and there is a big risk on relying on in-house data that all you do is measure your own in-house performance. Mm -hmm. You're not measuring what the consumer thinks of you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's quite an appetite for bringing together huge soup of in-house data with external inputs from other areas. Okay. Um do you see a lack of communication between the researchers and the, uh, the people, the regular people that, who need to uh, have access to these uh, conclusions of these researches? I think we're not generally a very good sector mm -hmm. at communicating. And I've had this conversation with a number of people over the past few months, funnily enough. Uh, and we were looking at the personality profiles of a lot of people in the research sector. Um, and I don't know if you know the Myers-Briggs profiles, but there is a very famous profile called Myers-Briggs. And the majority of the researchers I meet fall into one side of the profile, and mm -hmm. they are at the extreme opposite to the people who are consuming the research on the other. So it feels a bit like Venus and Mars communication and they're sort of missing somewhere in the ether. Mm -hmm. And I think that either we need more communicators in the research sector, mm -hmm. because it's our job to sell, or we need to train those uh, IS type Myers-Briggs people into how to talk to the strategists at the other end. I am actually uh, a strategist type, mm -hmm. and I only like things on one piece of paper. Uh, that's if you're lucky. So actually, I do know that that translation job needs to be done and that storytelling job needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, looking forward, uh, what uh, do you think researchers should do or acquire in order to be heard more? Uh, what uh, steps uh, can they take? Well, I think that there are a number of things. One is to make sure that they have people at the front, uh, in the front office, if you like, mm -hmm. who can tell the stories. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but we did do some research with clients and asked clients what they thought the researcher of tomorrow would need. Uh, storytelling yeah. came up number one. Uh, an awareness of the business context was another one. So I think uh, that researchers need to learn more about the clients and what the clients' priorities are. Mm -hmm. Numeracy came up high because people do need core data analytics skills uh, and a sense of um, creativity. Nice. And I don't think we, we rarely say creativity near researchers, yeah. but they do need to be more creative. Okay. So uh, in what ways do you think experience design uh, takes a role in creating impact via research? Well, I am an ex-client. I'm a marketer, I'm not a researcher. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm coming at it from what would have created impact with me yeah. when I had all those budgets and all that money to spend. Uh, and I think <coughs> that the key is to have solid, hard evidence that creates an insight mm -hmm. that is usable. Uh, I used to get lots of things across my desk that I labeled interesting but not very useful. Uh, and you need to find that uh, joyous combination of something that your client can take to the finance director uh, and can use operationally. So I've had enough, frankly, of reports that just tell me the bleeding obvious. Mm -hmm. I need something that is going to take the thinking further, uh, going to enable the organization to disrupt itself uh, and going to provide me with some of the imagination and inspiration uh, that I need, because after all, I can read charts for myself. Okay. Uh, as Jake Nielsen put it in a recent, recent article, uh, the number of professionals working in the uh, user, user experience design uh, have risen uh, like 50% in the last 20 years. But not, uh, this is not the case in the uh, UX researchers area. What do you think is the reason for it? I think a lot of people think that they can just design on impulse mm -hmm. or for their own interests. Uh, and speaking as a consumer, mm -hmm. I'm fed up of people designing things for themselves and not for me. Uh, I look at my smartphone, I look at any of the devices that, uh, that um, could do with better design and think, if only they'd asked me, it wouldn't have happened this way. And I think technologists design for technologists not mm -hmm. for people like me who have busy lives and don't want all that cleverness. We just want it to work. Uh, it is a truth that actually more, design, more research goes on than people admit. Mm -hmm. They just don't call it research. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, for goodness sake, I would like to be asked more frequently uh, so that we could get rid of some of the functionality that only interests the nerd and doesn't interest the user. I see. Okay, so our last question. Uh, in a recent interview with Research Live, uh, you said that I do not think we have made ourselves important enough to clients, and with many other creative industries, we would benefit uh, greater. Uh, so, how do you think uh, researchers make themselves important and relevant uh, in the eyes of their clients? We're launching a model called Intelligence Capital, mm -hmm. which is intended to be able to communicate to the finance people and the, uh, the finance director, to, to the money men, why the model, which has research at its core, um, should be important to a business. Uh, and it's called Intelligence Capital because it is more than research. That is a center of it, but it is a learning organization. Mm -hmm. It is uh, creating serendipity out of that insight. It is mm. creating uh, a sense of self-knowledge in the business, which you need insight to do, because otherwise you're self-referencing, not externally referencing. But that model has to be created in terms that reflect shareholder value, EBITDA, growth, the sort of things that quite rightly our clients are obsessed about. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, all our models talk about, here's some lovely insight. And we've got to translate that into what 
the money men speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having us here. And it's been an honor to have uh, this interview with you. Thank you very much for asking me. You have a wonderful city and a wonderful country, so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you.